Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Women in Science event, the first in a three-part series co-produced by Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, or GEN, and the Rosalind Franklin Society. I'll be your host. I'm Juliana Lemire, science writer at GEN. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure and honor to have Dr. Kate Carrico here to talk about her work in the field of mRNA and how it has been harnessed to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we get started, I'll pass it over to the Executive Director of the Rosalind Franklin Society, Carla Shepard Rubinger, who will tell us a little more about RFS and the Vilcek Foundation. Carla, over to you. Thank you, Juliana. The Rosalind Franklin Society is again so pleased to be hosting this Women in Science series with our colleagues at GEN. The mission of the Society is to showcase and promote the careers of women scientists worldwide. Many, like Rosalind Franklin, work tirelessly without recognition, but with an uncommon passion and commitment for their work. Dr. Franklin's now famous Photograph 51 was the cornerstone of the discovery of DNA, but was given little recognition during her lifetime. Our speaker today so clearly fits this model. She is passionate about her work and has always been quite optimistic about her pioneering research on the mRNA technology. In a recent interview, she claimed, I never doubted it would work. This is confidence, not bravado. Given the profound impact of her work, the Vilcek Foundation has just honored her with the 2022, 2022 Vilcek Prize for Excellence in Biotechnology ahead of schedule. We're excited to hear more about her work, followed by a brief follow-up interview with Juliana and hopefully time for audience questions at the end. Thank you so much for all for being here. Back to you, Juliana. Thanks, Carla. Today's presentation is also being sponsored by TriLink. TriLink Biotechnologies, part of Maravai Life Sciences, is a CDMO helping life science leaders and innovators overcome challenges in the synthesis and scale up of nucleic acids, NTPs, and mRNA capping analogs with scale-up expertise and unique mRNA production capabilities, including its proprietary clean cap mRNA capping technology. TriLink continues to expand its CGMP and general mRNA oligonucleotide and plasmid manufacturing capacity at its new global headquarters in San Diego, California to support therapeutic vaccine and diagnostic breakthroughs. So thank you to TriLink. Lastly, I wanna mention that we welcome your questions for Kate. So please just drop them into the Q&A of the Zoom and we'll try to take as many as we can at the end of her talk. So it's likely that you hadn't heard of Kate Carrico before last year, unless maybe you work in the field of RNA. It's probably equally as likely that you have heard of her before today. You may even have seen her on CNN. Kate is the Senior Vice President at BeyondTech. For her entire career, she has focused on mRNA, the molecule that has been thrust into the limelight because it sits at the center of two highly successful COVID-19 vaccines. Today, Kate will talk about her pioneering research in mRNA and how it provided the tools necessary to develop those vaccines. But her story goes far beyond her work in the lab. It is also a story of perseverance, dedication, and a love of science. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. And today I will talk about development of mRNA for therapeutic. And that not was speed actually added by the organizer, but this is very true. It was not that fast that, uh, you know, the vaccine itself was developed. So um, the, The RNA, messenger RNA history is uh, 60 years. So it started in 1961, discovering the mRNA. And um, through the years, through the last 60 years, a lot of things happened. And uh, although the first one, the day 61, I do not remember, but the rest of it, I was witnessing and or participating in it. And because uh, I don't have the whole afternoon to talk about all of these uh, years, what happened, I just try to 
give you some uh, through my through my uh, um, uh, how I uh, witnessed all of these years and uh, since um, uh, uh, since it was said also that uh, by uh, Steve Jobs that uh, only we can connect the dots looking back so so that uh, I try to connect those dots in my uh, past and um, so how I started it is uh, as a student, uh, undergraduate student in Hungary, and uh, I joined the lipid lab and I spent the summer collecting specimen fish fats, just to try to understand that uh, how the fat composition is changing depending on what kind of chow they eat. And I collecting this specimen and in the fall, I went back and um, to the lab and analyzed that. And this was the time when uh, two of the colleague also came and uh, Erno and Eva, and uh, they decided that they want to use um, uh, and generate phospholipids and uh, use it for delivering plasmid to the cell. And of course I was an undergraduate, everything was new for me. This was also and very exciting. And um, so I joined them and participated in that study. Of course, phospholipid uh, fraction, which uh, actually they want to use uh, was uh, not available. We were behind the iron curtain and it was under embargo. So Ernie went to the slaughterhouse and came back with a co-brain and we spent the whole week isolating uh, the required fraction, phosphatidylserine ethanolamine fraction, and then uh, wrapped it up the plasmid and uh, delivered to mammalian cells. So um, delivering uh, nucleic acid with lipids was not novel, uh, not new even in, in that time. Actually, in the mid 70s, Papa Hadjopoulos already described how to make liposome. And uh, for me, the first paper really, when mRNA was delivered in to mammalian cells and primary mammalian cells was published in 1978, uh, Dimitriadis. And uh, uh, this RNA was not in vitro transcribed because we don't know how to, at that time, we didn't know how to uh, synthesize, but he isolated uh, this uh, from uh, 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 reticulocytes and it was uh, uh, globin mRNA. So uh, that was my uh, work in a lipid lab as an undergraduate. And for my PhD, I, I went to the RNA lab. I didn't know at that time that RNA and the lipid were always <laughs> so close to each other, but um, uh, I stay in the same institute and my supervisor was uh, Jenny Thomas and um, he made uh, cap analogs. And of course, today you can order cap analogs but uh, he made uh, it for uh, Aaron Shatkin and Furuichi, who discovered 75 that the messenger RNA has a cap. And to identify the molecules, they needed reference material and they needed a good uh, organic chemist like Yenu who would synthesize and then send it to them. And um, it was interesting, I might mention that here all of my colleague, Janusz Ludwig and all of the others were organic chemists and I was a biologist and um, it was in all in my subsequent uh, years, I always worked with people who had a very different uh, uh, expertise than what I had or what I supposed to do. And, but here, actually we didn't make mRNA, we were in the seventies, but uh, we were interested to make a, a very interesting molecule, the two prime, five prime link oligoadenylate. This was just discovered in 1977, Ian Kerr in uh, London, and um, uh, it was assumed that uh, uh, when double-stranded RNA activates oligoadenylate synthase uh, uh, enzyme, this uh, molecule is formed, and this uh, two prime, five prime link uh, small trinucleotide is activating an enzyme which is responsible for uh, antiviral effects. So, we were in uh, this 70s and uh, we needed so badly an antiviral molecule. I did, you know, we need uh, also today. And uh, it seemed that uh, uh, we, if we can synthesize that and deliver, maybe we have uh, some very good antiviral compound and the pharmaceutical uh, company uh, supported this uh, activity. Um, 
It is also might mention here that um, whenever I subsequently work, I always kept my eye on all of those molecules I was uh, started with uh, my uh, career. And then, for example, the OAS just recently identified how important it is for those who um, uh, have a COVID infection uh, uh, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 infected people who had low level of OAS for some genetic reason, they are uh, very in serious trouble and uh, serious uh, disease form. So we were doing this, uh, but uh, the delivery was uh, difficult, although uh, with this liposome, which we already did in the lipid uh, unit, um, could give a solution, but it was kind of uh, um, uh, tedious uh, to make uh, with this film method and the wrapping of molecules. And so we ran out of fund and uh, I ended up uh, in uh, Philadelphia in Professor Suhadonik's laboratory. He was, uh, he wrote the uh, textbook on uh, modified nucleosides and uh, he was main interest in different kind of analogues. And all of this had uh, some cytotoxic effect. And um, one of them actually cordycepin, which I already used in Hungary because it was easy to make two prime, five prime because it was three prime dioxy molecule. And the professor also uh, discovered that pseudouridine could be made some uh, microorganism as a de novo uh, nucleosides. But uh, I learned here that all of these nucleosides is quite uh, toxic. But uh, here again, my responsibility was to focus on this uh, two prime, five prime linked nucleotides. And we did uh, so many different modification introduced internucleotide linkage and, and the nucleobase and, um, uh, and the five prime. And, and, and we also changed the sh sugar in it. And um, of course, um, we would have needed very much an uh, uh, antiviral compound because here in uh, now we are in, uh, in the 80s. Uh, HIV was a very uh, serious problem and uh, there were uh, no cure for uh, those patients who get infected. Although we couldn't use this molecule, but because we set up all of the assay, which was related to this interphone induced mechanism, we participated uh, in 1985-86 uh, uh, in a clinical trial run by Hahnemann University, where uh, double-stranded RNA was used uh, to treat uh, HIV patient. These were mismatched double-stranded RNA. It is kind of like the poly-IC, but uh, there were some mismatches there and it was um, less uh, uh, toxic. Actually, double-stranded RNA was early 70s already was a clinical trial and even today is not, in, uh, not approved because uh, when uh, too little is not enough and too much is too toxic. And uh, interestingly, is that time we didn't know how double-stranded RNA in using the interferon. And uh, we had to wait up until 2001 when the first uh, molecule, the first receptor were identif was identified and it was toll-like receptors. But it, this, this time we didn't know. And uh, I was always curious that how a double-stranded RNA could in use interferon. Uh, I have to leave again the laboratory and uh, uh, I ended up uh, the tour in uh, Uniform Service University of Health Sciences, where I learned a lot of basic uh, molecular mechanism. Although the plasmid isolation was, we still did a very tedious cesium chloride ultra centrifugation. But many things uh, I learned there, which was just introduced. And one of them was, you know, the uh, trisol, which was uh, Chomchinsky introduced and it made the RNA isolation so easy. The TAC polymerase was the molecule of the year in 89 and, uh, and uh, T7 and SP6 uh, phage polymerases were introduced to make RNA. And uh, for me, it was uh, important that one day uh, a student from uh, Phil Fagner uh, lab walked in with a lipofectin and he said that uh, it is good for delivering nucleic acid. So it was um, a lot of progress was made and then I learned all of this right there. And then I, uh, I worked here one year and ended up in a, a University of Pennsylvania. And my colleague, Elliot Barnett and cardiologist, he paid my salary. And then I tried to apply for grants. It is known that it was not very successful, but 
he had money and then we started to use the uh, messenger RNA. And uh, the idea was that um, it would be a therapeutic RNA and, um, and uh, we will uh, apply for, for different uh, uh, research as well as uh, therapeutic purposes. And um, so we made uh, mRNA and this uh, coded for urokinase and that was the first uh, success what we had because when we delivered uh, this uh, uh, receptor actually uh, needed post-translationally modified glycosylated and GPI anchor to the cell, all of this decoration is needed to be functional. And we were surprised that um, delivering the RNA cell knew all what to do, and then we get functional protein, which bind to the urokinase. Of course, um, prior to that, I did a lot of effort to deliver, like uh, uh, to fix, uh, to, to uh, treat uh, cystic fibrosis and the receptor I uh, delivered to cells, and it was never get the full protein. And it was, uh, so I was very uh, anxious to make sure that um, when we deliver an RNA, uh, certain cells has to have those things which is needed to process properly the uh, protein to make it functional. Anyway, that um, Elliot was doing bypass surgeries and then we had blood vessels and we tried to see that how we can apply it to, to deliver some kind of therapeutic uh, encoding mRNA so that uh, the patency of that blood vessel is uh, better. But the... Uh, Changes came when uh, uh, Elliot had to leave and um, uh, charismatic uh, resident, uh, David Langer convinced the chairman of neurosurgery that neurosurgery needs a molecular biologist and they should give a lab. And then this is, a, I get a lab and then I get some funding and uh, we started to work uh, with uh, David. His idea was to make uh, INOS encoding mRNA because um, uh, he identified a, a problem in um, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, the blood vessel uh, vasoconstriction, and he thought that if uh, he, he could deliver the mRNA there and locally the nitric oxide is released by this uh, and made this enzyme, then uh, uh, it can have a vasodilatation. And um, so we did a lot of studies, uh, looked at uh, through cranial window in a small pig. We traveled to Buffalo, look at in uh, rabbit models. We were in Chicago and uh, checked out in uh, subarachnoid uh, model system in, uh, uh, in the university, but uh, we had to go back always and try to improve because we couldn't show that uh, it, it works. So I um, stay in neurosurgery and try to make mRNA for uh, uh, stroke treatment and uh, with different model, but um, David had to leave. And uh, uh, then I met uh, Drew Weissman, who happened to uh, arrive to uh, Penn from uh, uh, Anthony Fauci's lab, and his uh, main goal was to uh, develop uh, uh, pro um, prophylactic as well as therapeutic HIV vaccine. And he was uh, experimenting with, um, he used the human uh, dendritic cells, and um, he uh, tried to use plasmid and other uh, and peptide protein to make uh, uh, the dendritic cells to present uh, this antigen. and. Uh, Really, we met at the Xerox machine and the copy machine. And luckily, because it was in 98, and from 2002, I did not copy anything. I was uh, reading all of the papers digitally. So, but that time I still had to copy and put in, you know, to the uh, cabinet, as all of us did, the scientists. So we were talking and uh, I uh, told Drew that, oh, I, I can make that uh, gag mRNA that he was interested in. And he used that and uh, uh, he was very happy that uh, it activated uh, this in vitro transcribed RNA, the dendritic cells, and um, uh, he got a good immune response and, and uh, he got a uh, high level of uh, antigen was uh, produced. I was not very much worried of that uh, result, but more like when his study showed that the uh, inflammatory cytokines were secreted by this mm. RNA that uh, uh, was made. And uh, 
that, that was a very bad news for me as, as I wanted to use the mRNA to uh, therapeutic purposes. And as I mentioned for stroke treatment, and that is the last thing a, a stroke patient would need more inflammatory cytokines to induce. So to tell you just what happened during this uh, time in other people's laboratory, I might mention here that um, in the 90s, the early 90s, other people, what they did, there were one application for therapeutic use. It was vasopressin RNA for uh, Floyd Bloom, uh, published uh, at uh, Script, where uh, they could uh, show therapeutic benefit. And other people also used uh, the mostly for, uh, for vaccination. And uh, there were two papers here. The first one was by the French team, Pierre Meonin and uh, his colleague. They did uh, delivered with liposome, actually, uh, uh, nucleoprotein specific uh, influenza uh, encoding RNA. And uh, the same kind of uh, RNA was uh, same kind of uh, uh, encoding. The, uh, product was used by uh, the Karolinska uh, scientist Lirstam. He used uh, self amplifying RNA and he injected uh, naked to vaccinate. But uh, most of the 90s and uh, from 95, 90 and later on actually focused on cancer vaccine. Their messenger RNA, in vitro transcribed messenger RNA was used for cancer vaccine. Uh, David Curiel uh, um, used the uh, he also injected uh, uh, the animals in uh, the mRNA as naked, and Gilboa actually he used lipofactamine. And um, so the scientists already focusing on uh, using not uh, uh, mRNA coding for some kind of uh, uh, reporter protein, but uh, try to find some use for messenger RNA. And uh, uh, with the Drew to try to understand that uh, why uh, uh, with this messenger RNA I am in vitro synthesizing is uh, immunogenic, we thought that uh, maybe maybe because uh, it's coming to the dendritic cells from outside. And so what we plan is to use um, uh, in vitro transcribed RNA and uh, isolated RNA. We re isolated from mammalian cells, different types of RNA, and uh, we uh, exposed to the dendritic cells and measure the TNF alpha. And here is the result. This is the most important one, finding that um, not, all messen not all of the RNA is equal. The in vitro transcribed mRNA was the most immunogenic and tRNA was not immunogenic at all. And all of this uh, TNF alpha induction is coming from the RNA because RNA's treatment eliminated the signal. So we knew that uh, tRNA has a lot of uh, modified nucleoside, 25% of it is modified. So we thought that um, maybe, maybe the modification is the reason. But of course, there were other things because these RNA were much shorter. And so there are many things was in our mind. But nevertheless, we could see some correlation, and we wish that this in vitro transcribed RNA would be have a lot of lot of modification, maybe, and then we would have an mRNA which is not immunogenic at all. But how we could do that? So you have to know that all of the RNA is made from the four basic nucleotides in our body, and after RNA is produced, a different kind of enzyme modifying enzymes who will introduce changes, methylation, and sometimes very, very complex changes. But these modifying enzymes not only were not available, they were also not known. So what should we do? There are so many uh, different kind of modification in the RNA. I am showing here the 108 different one. And uh, how could we how could we incorporate this to the RNA or how could we make it? So we did in a way that um, how nature is not doing, we purchased the nucleotide triphosphate. Uh, uh, and actually we purchased from Trilink, recommendation of my uh, uh, organic chemist friend who was, you know, we were together in Hungary in the lab and then he also worked in RNA. And even today he's uh, advising me on everything organic chemical related and RNA related projects. So Janos Ludwig told me that he ordered from Trilink and then I ordered only, which is naturally occurring in our body because I already learned during the years that if it is not naturally occurring in our body, it could be very, very toxic. 
So we purchased uh, 10 of those because that was available in high concentration, this triphosphate, and we made the RNA. And um, five of them were not incorporated, so we generated the five. Of course, we crossed our fingers that uh, from the 108, we didn't know which one is important, that maybe one of those five is still very important. So what happened is that after um, generating the uh, RNA, we tested out on uh, dendritic cells, and we found that um, some of them is uh, still immunogenic, just like the unmodified one, the blue is here, and some of them did not induce any TNF-alpha. What turned out that those who were not inducing TNF-alpha, all of them had some kind of uh, modification in the uridine. So, uh, we, in this paper, we also identified that uh, actually toll-like receptor 7 and toll-like receptor 8 is responsible. And uh, 10 years later, uh, crystal structure demonstrated why uh, uridine-containing single-stranded RNA, or in the case of toll 8, which is present only in human cells, why um, uh, uridine, the nucleoside itself, can activate and uh, uh, as a result of it uh, induce interferon. And uh, for us, of course, uh, we want to make, a, I wanted to make a, a RNA, which would code for a protein. So it was important to see that whether it translates. Because the uridine modification is critical, we had three of them, three modified, none of them were immunogenic, but uh, one of them was not translated, M5U translated similarly like the contain. And uh, we had a pseudo uridine, which containing RNA translated so much better. And uh, we spent like uh, two, three years trying to understand why this is uh, translating better. And, um, and also uh, try to um, uh, understand that how we could purify the RNA because we uh, noticed already that uh, there was some double-stranded RNA there. And so we work a couple of years here from 2008 to 2012, where finally, you know, we could have uh, an RNA which was uh, nucleoside modified, purified, and um, and we could uh, test it out in vivo in mice. And here in red, you can see that when we injected a messenger RNA, a very small amount, 0.1 microgram, to the mice, we could see that erythropoietin level, this mRNA coded for erythropoietin, was uh, quite a long time. We could detect and um, Whereas when we had the unmodified one, the translation was much shorter. And more importantly for us, there were no interferon was induced. Uh, of course, it was uh, 2014 when first time it was shown that uh, if interferon is induced, uh, usually the uh, antibody uh, production is not that uh, uh, favorable. But uh, Right now that we just try to understand the system and uh, we were very glad and especially me because uh, this is the first time I could see that uh, an mRNA coding for a therapeutic protein is um, functioning because uh, after injection uh, could see that the hematocrit was increased in the animal the EPO makes more red blood cells. And then uh, it, uh, in the case of mice, the uh, half-life of those red blood cells is uh, uh, 40 days, and then a weekly injection of the EPO could maintain for uh, for a whole month uh, the high level. And uh, uh, subsequent years, here after 2012, uh, a lot of work was done to optimizing the system and uh, uh, codon and uh, codon optimizing as well as. Um, uh, other uh, structural element we optimized, purified, and, and many, many different things we did. One of the also important is this CAP structures, which um, uh, first we introduced CAP1 structure mm -hmm. enzymatically, and later on we used the clean CAP uh, from trialing. And so in one part, we could uh, make a very potent uh, uh, RNA. So after all of this optimization, of course, uh, the, our vision was at now at the BioNTech is that uh, we have to express uh, the drug in the patient. And one of the study what we did in mice when we delivered nucleoside modified mRNA coding for uh, bispecific antibodies, and we could uh, uh, eliminate uh, large tumors in mice. And subsequently, we also uh, 
performed an experiment where um, intratumorally we injected uh, messenger RNA coding for cytokines and show that not only the tumor which was injected, but uh, remotely located tumors were eliminated in mice. And, um, and those studies already uh, uh, advanced to uh, clinical trial. So while we were working, and because my, my main interest was also uh, always therapeutic, uh, making mRNA uh, coding for some therapeutic protein, but um, colleagues in uh, another field, you know, they advanced the uh, formulation, which is a very critical and important part of the mRNA delivery. And uh, Peter Kulis, Tom Madden, and Ian McLean, he in um, uh, companies like uh, Proteva, Tecmira, and, uh, and Aquitas, uh, they um, generated uh, uh, lipid uh, nanoparticles that were um, uh, used for siRNA delivery. And then in those um, later years, they also uh, adjusted this system to deliver messenger RNA. The important is that different kinds of lipids uh, are present in, uh, in these particles. And uh, now that uh, with this uh, uh, formulation, it could be reached that the uh, RNA formulated with this uh, LMP, it had a shelf life. So it could be frozen in, and in minus uh, 70, 80 Celsius, it could be stored for years. So previously, all of the assay, all of the uh, delivery material was that we put the RNA, we put the uh, lipofectin or put the transit in, and then in uh, two, three minutes, we had to inject. So it was not very uh, feasible to use in a therapeutic setting. So, um, my colleagues, uh, Drew Weissman, and in his laboratory, Norbert Pardee, did um, messenger RNA coding for the Zika uh, uh, pre-membrane and envelope protein and uh, formulated with this lipid nanoparticle provided by Aquitas. And um, he demonstrated that when this uh, uh, mRNA was injected to monkeys, then uh, they were protective and single injection of 50 microgram in a monkey uh, protected the monkey from uh, in Zika viral infection. So this was um, uh, done in a Drew Weissman lab by Norbert and uh, similar experiments were done at, um, at uh, Washington University and also in, a, in a Moderna. And uh, Moderna already initiated clinical trial with uh, using the uh, nucleoside modified RNA LMP formulation for influenza. And um, uh, Norbert and uh, uh, Drew Weissman lab also used a similar uh, formulation and uh, uh, RNA for um, uh, HIV vaccine in animal studies as well as um, uh, influenza. And, um, and herpes symbol. And uh, so studies already showed that uh, no matter what this um, formulation uh, with uh, nucleoside modified LMP was very protective and very effective. And uh, so that uh, uh, all of these uh, studies uh, demonstrated that um, Maybe the nucleoside modified RNA is uh, also uh, the optimal for uh, vaccination. Previously, we thought that maybe the unmodified one, but uh, these studies uh, and uh, Norbert uh, subsequently did studies showing that uh, why uh, uh, follicular T helper cells is um, uh, important for this uh, good vaccine production and uh, why modified nucleoside modified RNA we get a better response. So uh, here we went uh, for all of these years, and uh, this last slide uh, which I am showing you uh, demonstrate that um, what you already or all, all of you know that um, uh, we learned in 2020 that um, there is a virus is coming, and then we learned in the genetic sequence in January. And uh, through, the year, through the one year, we finally, uh, by the end of the year, we could uh, have vaccine, which uh, I was lucky to receive, and uh, many others. And now that uh, 
here in the US, everybody who want to have the vaccine could have it. And uh, uh, we already, and daily we can hear about mRNA uh, vaccine. So uh, the public is uh, well aware of uh, what, uh, uh, what this uh, mRNA vaccine can do. And uh, so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that terrific talk. Wow. I'm, it's just wonderful to learn about all of the work that has gone into this huge puzzle um, and terrific. And if we can have you for a little bit longer, we'll um, ask you some questions, both from myself and from the audience who've been sending in some great questions. Um, so my first question is, you've been working on mRNA for a long time. So what is it about RNA that first caught your attention? What is it about it that's held your attention for so long? And have you ever considered working on anything else? So um, in, the, in the early 90s, um, as the Human Genome Project advanced, everybody was focusing uh, who were on that field to introduce some kind of gene therapy is uh, uh, the monogenic diseases to fix. And when the gene was known, they tried to deliver. But my thinking was more that uh, many of the diseases are uh, what we have is more like ache and pain. And then uh, we just need uh, very temporarily some kind of uh, mRNA and uh, which would be just transient so that it is good that it is not you know, not forever. I was not thinking about ever to make a vaccine. And uh, if uh, I don't meet Drew, you know, I am just keep trying to make uh, uh, mRNA for therapy. And uh, I don't know what point I would uh, realize that uh, it is immunogenic if he's not <laughs> uh, telling me that. But uh, um, I just, uh, during the first 10 years when I was working with the short RNA molecule, I, I learned all of this enzyme, which I can phosphorate, which I, what I can, many, many different enzymes. And oh, I was just so uh, used to work with RNA. And, um, and I thought that the messenger RNA is, uh, could be a, a medicine. Okay, terrific. Um, so getting into, moving a little bit into COVID-19, when did you first realize that RNA vaccines were going to be so crucial in combating COVID-19? Um, so even about the virus, so when it was, uh, I heard in February that what happened in China, I was not the visioner who realized that uh, now that we need a vaccine. This was uh, Ugur Zahin, our CEO, realized that immediately and uh, I, um, I was not, um, although I was involved in the Pfizer project because uh, in 2018, we signed up with Pfizer to co-develop uh, um, a vaccine for influenza. And, um, but uh, uh, I was not uh, uh, designing the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And then I was um, uh, participating on a way that many of the elements which e eventually get to the vaccine, my team was working on that, so that uh, the cap, uh, the formulation, and other things. But um, I, I mean, uh, I hope that um, the vaccine will work, and um, and uh, I am very glad <laughs> that it uh, turned out how it is. But um, why I thought that it uh, it uh, definitely it will work, uh, uh, maybe, and and will be as good. Maybe I am just naive. I don't know enough about um, respiratory viruses that, um, and so I just kind of <laughs> thought that it would work. Well, I don't think it's naivete. I think it's working. So I think, uh, I think you were right about that. Um, so you moved from academia to industry and, you know, that's, a move that more and more scientists are making nowadays, certainly than 20 or even 10 years ago. Was that an easy move to make? 
Is there anything that you miss about academia? And what would you say to people who are considering a similar move? Um, honestly, it, is, um, it was um, uh, very refreshing. Uh, I, I myself, uh, we do, together with Drew Weissman, we established a small company, but uh, we were kind of virtual company. But um, I learned about, uh, you know, what um, important for what is important for a product. But uh, going to uh, Germany and working at BioNTech uh, for me was refreshing that no longer another paper and other paper, which is the measure of uh, your uh, productivity, but uh, you have to have something meaningful, a product which had to be uh, functional, helping somebody, a patient. And that was, uh, for me, it was very refreshing. And also that uh, how everybody worked together. So it was, um, we need a product and uh, everybody was in. And uh, so that uh, for me, it was, uh, it, it was a great feeling. It seems so sometimes in academia that uh, uh, people need to be first out or last out something and they are already, without starting the project, they are already fighting for, for those kind of position. And so, that was, um, and of course, it was uh, it was nice that um, you know I had excellent colleagues there at uh, at BioNTech, and uh, Ugur Zahin, the CEO, is also a scientist uh, in the core, not just uh, uh, heading the whole company. And so that was uh, also a great feeling. So I was very happy, and I am still there. So just <laughs> I am home office right now. I am missing them. <laughs> Got it. Um, there is no doubt that your story and your work has inspired many early career scientists out there and probably some budding scientists as well. Who inspired you along the way? Um, definitely my teachers, even from the elementary school and, um, and at, the, at the university, at the research center where I work. And uh, I was so glad just in May, I met uh, several of them. I, and um, I could thank them for, for their help because uh, they were, you know, we were behind the iron curtain, but uh, they could, uh, they did their best uh, to educate us. And, and uh, so I, my colleagues and uh, my colleagues also those uh, scientists that who I never met but reading their paper you know they were I was just so proud that uh, what they have done and uh, and also my colleagues that I'm working with work within uh, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania and and uh, BioNTech and of course the um, vaccine uh, needed all of the scientists and just BioNTech and Pfizer and, and their, their expertise. So those people who had to figure out technically and many other things, I am just admire all of them. Okay, terrific. So um, I want to get to some of the questions coming in from the audience. We have so many great questions. Um, so Jean, so this is kind of getting back to the, the industry angle for a second. Jean asks, Don Kennedy said that science doesn't exist until it's published. What do you think of publication policies in biotech companies? So uh, we uh, at BioNTech we published uh, our results, and uh, so I just presented, you know, the Nature Medicine paper and Nature and all of my colleagues there. So, so when we are doing something, it's not just in a, a patent, but uh, it is uh, we put in out. And public and, and and other companies uh, as well were doing that. So um, I don't. I haven't seen that uh, uh, at at Biontech that we have to hold back because mm -hmm. of that. So uh, great publications are out from Biontech, and uh, so okay. Um, and and oh, Anne has a question. Do you anticipate? that now more of our vaccines will be RNA-based RNA vaccines. And why do you think we have just now deployed this approach? 
as, as I mentioned, um, uh, actually, even the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, this was not the first uh, target. Human trial by uh, Moderna already run in uh, two years before that in Germany. They, but of course, it was 200 people was involved in the trial. And of course, we all of us wanted, uh, you know, step by step to um, test out more um, um, uh, more participant and analyzing, but uh, when uh, we needed urgently, then uh, things accelerated. But uh, emphasizing that uh, nothing was cut, that uh, you know safety or something. It was about that already material was prepared for phase two or phase three before knowing the outcome. And of course, you know the government. Uh, said, uh, you know, the take over the responsibility, paying for it if it is failed. And then that's how it encouraged the companies just to proceed. So that's why uh, it could be done in a shorter time. Okay. But it will, it will uh, definitely more, more uh, uh, mRNA vaccine will, will come and it will be benefit for all of us. Okay. Terrific. Um, beyond mRNA. Is there a field or a scientific application on the horizon that you think is very exciting? Something else going on? I mean, the messenger RNA application for a different kind of disease. We have seen recently Intelia reported that they delivered Cas9 uh, mRNA and they could edit uh, and uh, treat uh, transgenesis. Um, uh, in a patient by editing their uh, 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 genome in, in the liver. And of course, uh, new uh, formulations are coming that will reach the bone marrow cells and then other diseases like uh, thalassemia or, or uh, HIV can be treated. But uh, formulation, uh, I see myself, uh, is a number one, which will advance the field. I don't see... Uh, much that the RNA, what can be changed, but of course, always you can improve, <laughs> but um, formulation will open up new field and that would be maybe the genome editing. So after all, maybe the transient, because of course the Cas9 uh, mRNA also, and the enzyme is transiently there, and eventually the um, uh, messenger RNA will fulfill the promise of gene therapy because then it is permanent change will be result and editing uh, disease uh, genome. Yes, actually that is a great segue to Charles's question, which was, which you just touched on, which are what are the advantages and disadvantages of using mRNA versus editing DNA? I. I mean, uh, using uh, the RNA uh, is important because it will degrade quickly. Because um, if the editing enzyme is uh, lingering around too long and because you deliver as a virus, for example, or, or a plasmid, then uh, the, um, it will be uh, Cas9 or any editing uh, protein will be uh, generated for a longer time period and more likely that some unwanted uh, adverse effect will happen. So the, so the RNA can be uh, modified in a way that it will be even the half-life would be shorter and because this would be critical for that. And uh, that's the same for the vaccine. You, you know, the, uh, you don't want to make uh, S protein for for the rest of your life. It will be a very short period of time there and as well as the mRNA. Okay, got it. Um, so as you mentioned during your talk, you've overcome some hurdles in your career, not receiving grant funding, for example. What kept you going through the tough times? Maybe I did not realize that it is a tough time because it was a lot of fun and uh, sitting at the bench and thinking about the experiment is, is always, there is always a new solution, a new idea comes and then which explain why the previous experiment did not result in the expected result or you didn't get that. And then uh, you are uh, high on that. You have the new idea maybe and that will work. And then it is, it is just, um, 
you have to enjoy uh, doing these things. And maybe in, isn't, this job is not for everybody, but uh, if you enjoy doing uh, research, and um, then, then uh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> that's what you need. No, no, you know, anyway, you don't have time to spend money because you are always in the lab. So, <laughs> so little money is enough. But uh, of course, it would have been better if um, uh, some support comes way. I just counted 40 something grant I was not getting. But even writing the grant, uh, I did not advertise to my colleagues. But I love to do that because I had to think through and I had to read a lot. And it was, and, uh, it was fun. Uh, writing grants. Now I can <laughs> say that, but that's how I felt, even even when it was, uh, you know, not appreciated. But um, I also not thinking about that those people are who are evaluated and said, uh, you know, not not good. I always thought that maybe I I should do something better, you know, improve. Maybe I not. Of course, you never have enough uh, background experiment, but you know maybe not articulated well enough or something. And and I always try to see that what I can do to make it better. Yeah, that's tremendous advice. I mean, having a, any rejection can either kind of bring you down, right, or you can try to overcome that. So that's that's. Yeah, so you know, actually, from the Uniform Service University was the only place where I willingly left because all of the other places I was sent away. And but every time it was, uh, you know, when you are kicked out or you know terminated in your position, you just have to think that you have a new opportunity to find, you know, a new job or something new. And um, so that's how, and um, and not to think that much about, you know, that. Um, um, there is um, nothing fair, of course, that other person is doing less research and get promoted or something, because you have to always focus on what you can do, because otherwise you get uh, disappointed immediately. And uh, of course, life is not fair, but we are, if you are at the bench, you are already a much better position than anywhere on the earth, you know, somebody, because you, you are at, uh, you can do something. Um, so David Langer told Gina Collada when she wrote her article about you, Kate's genius was a willingness to accept failure and keep trying and her ability to answer questions people were not smart enough to ask. So what do you think is the key to being a successful scientist? Is it what David Langer said or something else? Uh, you have to stay curious. You want you wanted to know. And if your goal is, uh, I, I want to understand how could it be and so many enigmatic things in science. So then, then you are not disappointing when you read uh, something you are thinking and you are reading a paper somebody already published because you are happy. You wanted to understand, oh, okay, somebody already helped you to understand. So you don't have to those, do those experiments. If you look at things this way, you are always happy. Even if uh, you know people are reporting on what you were doing, because you, the goal has to be to better understand, and uh, don't uh, take it that you are working for the company or working for the boss or somebody. If you working on something to understand, you put all of these things. And listen, your boss will be very anxious if you want to leave. If you are very good, because you walk out and whatever is your head is leaving so that um, you you just have to read a lot that's that's it and then you can make connection uh, between different things because of course you can look it up everything on the internet the knowledge is there but if it is there you cannot make connection it has to be in your head and in whole in the biology in our field is uh, all working on analogies so some some analog there is a similar mechanism and more you know, then more you can think that, oh, there is a precedence for that. And then you can work from that on. Yeah, I wanna share a comment, not really a question in the chat as well from Jean that says, as a scientist, I know it takes a long time to learn about each piece of the puzzle. Everything we learn, including from unsuccessful grant applications and multiple labs, adds to the insights that only us older scientists can make. 
So I think she's sharing some of that sentiment there. Yes, so we we have to learn from everything. I. The truth is that I learn more from seeing things which uh, I said that I will never do that. It couldn't be that way. So that uh, from the bad example also, I, I learned. So even if somebody treated me badly, I, I remember that I will never say, do things like that. And and for many other things, when, when organizing the laboratory, for example, uh, when I left Penn, we had more than 6,000 RNA isolates. And to have everything, you know, like I was a bookkeeper to make sure that where it coming from, what is how it was characterized and setting up the whole system. Because previously, uh, once I realized that people get lost samples because they cannot, they don't have a system. So again, I set up the system because I have seen the bad example that how people lose things, samples and uh, other things. So, so that uh, that was you have to you learn from everything, good, bad, and and if uh, something, uh, you know, happened that you lose your job or the experiment is not, then then you just um, learn from it and uh, it uh, gives you an opportunity to go somewhere else, to do something else, or improve. Terrific. There are a couple of questions about using mRNA for cancer immunotherapy. What are your thoughts on that? So uh, as uh, I mentioned in the presentation, uh, messenger, in vitro transcribed messenger RNA was uh, mostly used for uh, uh, cancer vaccines. And uh, uh, the first company was Merix and uh, spun out from uh, Duke University. It was the first one using and then run clinical trial. Later it was called Argos. And then uh, also the uh, CureVac in 2000 was established to de develop uh, uh, messenger RNA-based cancer vaccine. The challenge is the people say, oh, they worked 20 years and if they couldn't figure out how this uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine could be good if they couldn't figure out, but uh, for the cancer vaccine. But for the cancer vaccine, the challenge is that what should be the antigen? And um, so even uh, the different antigens are identified, it's not necessary that is the driver mutation. And uh, so that's the major challenge. There are so many different uh, um, uh, mutation are there and uh, BioNTech and uh, Moderna, CureVac, they have programs for uh, messenger RNA encoding those uh, uh, neo epitopes so that uh, um, uh, those uh, proteins that had mutation, so the amino acid chain, and then uh, they could be identified similarly like the uh, vaccine for uh, infectious disease, but um, it is challenging. And so there are more, more science is, is needed. Got it. And, you know, there's, I mean, we're hearing so much in the news now about the variants, in particular, the Delta variant. Um, so one question in the chat asks, you know, what do you think about the effectiveness of the current vaccine against the Delta variant? And what is the plan going forward for what is sure to be more variants? I mean, uh, the data just came out. Uh, the uh, BioNTech Pfizer vaccine was 88% uh, 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 effective in uh, against the Delta variant. And um, so I am, as I mentioned, I, I am a biologist. I am focusing on uh, you know, therapeutic use of uh, mRNA. And, uh, and I don't want to sound here like I'm a vaccine expert and, and uh, epidemiologist. And, uh, but um, uh, we just have to follow the scientists that what um, uh, BioNTech and uh, Pfizer and, uh, and our the scientific leaders are saying uh, and measuring because now that uh, so much data is out, they are collecting in Israel, in the US, and uh, we understand that um, it, the, the uh, vaccine the, is very protective still against these uh, variants. And um, whether the third injection is needed yeah. or not, uh, I, it is up to, up to the scientists to decide who are measuring uh, the uh, different and following up the vaccinated people to see that whether how they get infected. 
But uh, definitely, uh, you know, I, I got the vaccine, my daughter, my husband, everybody in the family, my sister, everybody got the vaccine. And it is important for everybody to get the vaccine. Absolutely. Yes. I also got the vaccine and, and all of us who got the vaccine, thank you very much for all of your work. Um, I want to just before I close, I want to end. There's so many comments in the chat about what an amazing talk this was, how it was just wonderful to learn about all the decades of work that have gone into this vaccine, um, that your background is inspiring, um, and the curiosity is the mark of a true great scientist. So thank you again for sharing this story with us. And I'll just end by saying that this brings us to the end of our discussion and concludes part one of our Women in Science series. I want to again thank Kate and Carla for this terrific discussion and thank our team behind the scenes for making everything run so smoothly. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Thanks also to Trilink and the Vilcek Foundation for supporting this event. Please join us next month on Friday, August 13th, when we'll be talking to Amy Abernathy, the newly appointed president of Verily's clinical research business. And again, on October 1st, when we'll be speaking to Fiona Murray, the Associate Dean of Innovation and Inclusion at the MIT School of Management. Um, also, you'll be able to find today's event on demand on Jen's website. For everyone at Jen and the Rosalind Franklin Society, I'm Juliana Lemure. Stay safe and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much. And uh, I just want to say hello to all of the scientists who work hard like me and uh, just keep up with a good job. Thank you.